Good. Okay. So let me remind, let's review what we learned last time. <clears throat> We're going to be talking mostly about surfaces in 3D, but we'll be generalizing to hypersurfaces in ND. <clears throat> And we're going to be talking about curves in 3D and also about curves in ND, but mostly in 3D, base curves. <clears throat> and we, for the situation of surfaces, we can talk about at any point on the surface, there's a tangent plane a best fitting linear approximation, okay? And orthogonal to that tangent plane, we'll talk about there being a normal, okay? And so the slide <clears throat> shows a normal and a little area on the surface. Uh, and the DA sort of suggests that we can shift the normal by small amounts within a neighborhood, <coughs> uh, strictly a neighborhood on the tangent plane, but that can be projected right down onto the surface, orthogonal to the tangent plane. And so you can talk about a little region on the surface and the normal is going to swing. And what we said was <coughs> that depending on the direction you walk within that little patch, the normal is going to swing in, in a in a certain way. And so so what we're saying is that in the tangent plane, we have a vector B that we're going to call the walking direction. So that's the direction within that patch that we're going to uh, <clears throat> head off in and look at what the how the normal swings. And then we talked about the fact that we want to be able to talk about, and we're going to use this notation for directional derivative, the, the directional derivative of the normal as we walk in a particular walking direction, V. Okay? Um, and what we saw was, was that this, the normal would swing about some hinge, okay? And I'm gonna call that hinge C of V. So for any given walking direction, what's going to happen is if I walk in some direction, the normal's gonna swing around, rotate around a hinge. And I'm gonna call that hinge C of V with respect to the walking direction, okay? And that hinge is orthogonal to the vector in which the normal swings. So if you have a hinge here, obviously the swing is going, is going to be in a direction orthogonal to the hinge. <clears throat> and both of these, we said, all three of these, in fact, the walking directions in the tangent plane <clears throat> the the vector which is the swing of the normal is going to be in the tangent plane <clears throat> because the difference between two unit vectors that are epsilon apart is always orthogonal to the <clears throat> to the vector, and that's the, so the normal is one of those, and the orthogonal to the normal is in the tangent plane. And the hinge uh, is also in the tangent plane. So we have the tangent plane, <coughs> let that be the board, we have a hinge direction C, and a swing of the normal direction to C of V dv of the normal, orthogonal to it, <clears throat> okay? And then we said that we were going to um, talk about 
this walking direction V uh, in some frame for the change of plane. That's to say, some, some pair of vectors that are in the tangent plane and span, orthogonal and span the tangent plane, right? Okay, so we've got these two vectors. And for the time being, we, were, we decided to, to choose the spanning vectors as <clears throat> span by the walking direction and it's perpendicular. Okay, <clears throat> so we can talk about the component of the normal swing. <clears throat> so here we have a walking direction. Here we have an arbitrary coordinate system. Uh, but here we have a direction V. Here we have a direction V perp. And, and maybe the swing of the normal is a vector dv of n. Uh, it's also in the tangent plane. And so it can be written as k of v v plus p e D V of N can be decomposed into its component in the V direction and its co component in the V prep direction. We're going to call those K of V and T of V, respectively. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and K of V got the name normal curvature. It's the nosedive component. It's the swing of the normal. If you walk, if you're walking in this direction in the tangent plane, then there's a component of the normal that swings into the walking direction. And there's a component of it that swings orthogonal. We call that twist with respect to the normal direction. And the normal curvature is the nosedive rate. <laughs> And the twist is the the component in the in the other uh, direction. It, and we also noted that um, we we can um, find, and we'll say more about this, some special pair directions where if we walk in those directions, t is equal to zero. That is to say, it's pure nosedive directions, directions that there's no component of twist. You fall backwards or forwards at some rate, namely the, the, the coefficient of this, the coefficient of, sorry, the component in the walking direction. For that walking direction, v, v of n will be, well, t will be zero, and it'll be simply a constant times v. And, and the, the normal curvature is assigned, is, is, is in that case, a signed uh, value that we take to be positive if you fall back as you're walking along V and negative if you walk forward when, when you're walking along V. So that's the, that's the summary of what we said last time. Okay, and <clears throat> for those of you who joined, just, just joined, uh, Yatsung has a, a movie that he'll put on, make available to anyone in the department uh, uh, shortly after this lecture, and you'll be able to get get, get on Google Drive and, and play and play that lecture. <clears throat> okay, so so far I want to emphasize I've been doing pure geometry. I haven't said anything about how you represent a vector in a computer. I haven't said anything about how you know about the numerics at all. From this point of view, a vector is a, something with a tail, tail and a tip and it sits in three space and it, you know, it points somewhere. Don't bother me with coordinate systems, right? <laughs> okay, but obviously in the computer, we're going to need to represent it in terms of coordinates. 
okay? And we'll have to talk about that a little bit. But it's very important when doing geometry to realize what it is that's pure, plain and simple geometry and what it is that is uh, representations of the geometry. And, and so the idea of tangent plane is pure geometry. The idea of normal is pure geometry. The idea of principal direction is pure geometry. The idea of hinge is pure geometry. They all exist in this world where, where, where algebra is just an interpretation of geometry, right? And geometry is the real world, and, and algebra is about the interpretation of that. Uh, okay. So... Let's look at, uh, okay, so <clears throat> we will come back to this hinge. We're gonna be very interested in, in what its behavior is, but for the time being, we'll, we'll uh, not focus on it. <clears throat> Except, and, but we are gonna focus on this thing orthogonal to the hinge, which is the rate of swing of the normal per walking duration. <laughs> and what we've said here is that this is a vector that's linear in the coordinate system v, v, perp. So we can also write d, v, perp of n. That's a different hinge. It'll have a different hinge. Instead of walking in... The v direction, we're going to walk in the in this direction, and we're going to see how the normal swings and what the hinge is for that one. Okay. <laughs> and so we'll be able to compute k of v perp <coughs> times v perp right over here, k of v perp times v perp, that is to say, the nose dive for walking in the v perp direction, plus the twist of v perp when walking in the v direction. I mean, not for then. Sorry, you're walking in the v v perp direction, but it's the component in the v direction. Okay. <clears throat> this is uh, a pair of linear equations that are interesting for the following reason. This directional derivative operator is linear in two senses. It's linear in its argument, in this case, n. So if you decompose any pair of, ve pair of vectors into a weighted sum of other vectors, then you can figure out how those vectors, how the overall combined vector moves by, by, what the, by linear operations on the individual pieces. But the important other point is that not only is dv perp linear in its argument, it's linear in the walking direction. Okay? So d uh, <coughs> alpha v um, v plus beta v perp, where I'm going to take the convention that alpha squared plus beta squared equals one, so that the argument uh, is also a unit vector. <coughs> okay? The, this thing of anything, I don't care anything you want to fill in here, I'll fill in n, but it doesn't matter what I fill in there is simply alpha d v of the anything plus beta times uh, d v perp of the anything. Everything here being the normal for the time being. Later, we're going to fill in other things on the right side of that. But the point is that directional derivative operator, that's what this d in brackets, walking direction operator <clears throat> is completely is, is its 
linear in v uh, in the walking direction. But in another way, this is why you can look, can know that if you have a um, a, a gradient which is d e1 of any function at all, where e1 is, is a, a first direction, and d e2, which is a of f, if, if you have that pair in two, in two space or that n-tuple in n space, which we call the gradient, that uh, if you want to know what the v is, this is the gradient of f, you simply dot product v with this gradient vector. That's just the general statement that it's linear in these basic <coughs> linear in these measurements that are coordinate by coordinate, coordinate direction by coordinate direction in a right-handed coordinate system. Yeah. So does E1 and E2 uh, have to be orthogonal? Yes. E1, I'm talking always about right-handed, I'm talking about frames every time. So if I have a frame, which is, I defined last time as a, as a right-handed uh, orthogonal unit vectors system, <coughs> uh, then if I have all the, the directional derivatives with respect to the frame elements respectively, then I know how to take any other directional derivative. And that falls directly from, that's what, just a restatement of what I said, it's linear in the walking direction. <clears throat> but wait a second. That just says that taking derivatives, the directional derivative behavior, and the behavior of ordinary geometry of dot products to get components of things is exactly the same geometry. There's no difference. It's a complete isomorphism between directional derivatives on the one hand and directional components of things on the other hand. They behave exactly the same way. And as a result of that, if you had this E1, E2, E3 system, for example, which here is called X, Y, and Z, the basis can be called the pure X direction, EX, the pure Y direction, EY, or the pure Z direction, EZ, or it can be called the directional derivative in EX, which we call D by DX, the directional derivative in the Y direction, which we call partial derivative D by DY, and the directional derivative, and it doesn't matter because those two are completely up completely isomorphism. And so now when you read the literature, you will see people now stop calling them E, X, E, Y, E, Z. They just call them D by D, X, D, by, D by D, Y, and D by D, Z. And sometimes you can think of those as, der as derivative operators. Other times you can equivalently think of them as the unit vectors in the X, Y, and Z directions. So we're going to use that notation. D by D, X, D by D, Y, D by D, Z are the unit vectors in, in the X, Y, and Z direction. Okay, so now we have a coordinate system. If we want to uh, write, well, I mean, once we choose a particular x, y, z basis frame, <coughs> then we have coordinates and we can talk about vectors in terms of their components in those, in those coordinates. But the vectors are the vectors, and the but the components depend on the, the choice of coordinate system. But the, but the vectors themselves don't depend on the choice, of course, and they're a, a, a basic thing. Okay, so the next thing we need to do to talk, okay, so 
I'm going to do one thing quick here. What I want to interpret this pair of equations here as the matrix K of B, E of V, K of V perp, T of V perp times V V perp. <coughs> Right? And that's just those two equations written in matrix form. I think that the, the, the second row in the first matrix, the two elements should switch, right? Uh, sorry. Thank you. I made an error. It's very important that I not make that error. Thank you for fixing that. The K, the second one has got to be TK. Right on. Thanks for the help. Okay. Um, this matrix tells you what the swings are for V and V perp, but by virtue of this linearity, they tell you what the swing is going to be for any walking direction. That's a linear combination of V and V perp. So if I have a new walking direction, that's of the form alpha v plus beta v prep with the same requirement that alpha squared plus beta squared equals one, <coughs> we're going to be able to compute that. <coughs> Put another way, we're going to be able to compute k of any direction and t of any direction from the k's of these particular, k's and t's of these particular pair of directions. Okay, and what it turns out is, <coughs> that when you look at the algebra, what's going on is, if you want a new pair of directions, you're just rotating v, v, v perp to a different v, v perp system. <laughs> so the whole thing turns out to be a rotation. And what, and you remember I said there were these, um, there were the special directions that were pure nosedive. And that's just, you're gonna be able to find a rotation where the t's are zero. <clears throat> Moreover, very uh, soon, we're going to understand the very surprising relation that those two twists are the same. Okay? <clears throat> uh, completely non-intuitive, right? That when you walk in this direction, the, the, the rate at which you swing in the orthogonal to it is the same as when you walk in this direction and you're looking at the this, this swing in, in that. And when we do that, we end up seeing that this thing, this matrix is a um, diagonal matrix. And we know how to get diagonal matrices to change by rotating the coordinate system. We call that eigen analysis, right? <laughs> And so we're going to be, we could ultimately, we're going to algebraically understand this finding of the, the principal directions as diagonalizing that matrix by a rotation of your forces. So uh, that doesn't mean like uh, I can take any like V and D prime, then I get, I get this matrix, then I do again analyze it, then I can find the rotation. And, uh... Right on, Yazoom. Yeah, Absolutely right. Pick any new pair of walking directions that are orthogonal to each other and diagonalize it, and you're going to get the same eigenvectors. The same geom geometric eigenvectors. Let's be careful, right? Because the eigenvectors are written in algebraically in terms of your basis. So they're the same in that sense. They're the same geometrically. They're not the same pair of numbers. And you will indeed have the very same eigenvalues, which are the principal, which, which are the rates of principal component swing. Okay. Now, this this matrix ends up. I, I this is my my name for that matrix. Uh, I don't know that the literature calls it that. It's M sub Roman two. 
And that's because the sub-Roman two refers to something called the second fundamental form. And don't worry about the name. It's just an operator that turns walking directions into normal swing behaviors. Okay, so we're going to be interested in this M2 matrix, which is a uh, a linear a linear operator in um, in coordinates. This depend this M2 matrix as a matrix is uh, is uh, something that changes as you change the walking directions, but it's as an operator. Independent of coordinates, it's the operator that you put in a walking direction, and out out you get the um, you out out you get these the way the normal swings in this in in the coordinates of the walking direction, and it's perpendicular. Okay, and so we're going to be interested in this M2. This this we're going to come back again and again to this M2 matrix. Um. What do you know about matrices that share eigenvalues and uh, and have the eigenvectors related to just a, as being rewritten in the coordinate system by a rotation? What do you know algebraically are the invariants under that rotation? For any matrix, there are two two invariants under rotation. No one knows. The determinant and the trace. The determinant of a matrix is independent of the coordinate system. <clears throat> so if, the, if you rewrite the matrix with a new base, in a new basis, the determinant doesn't change and the trace doesn't change. And we're going to make use of that. And this previous slide, in fact, whoop, I need to be in. This previous slide, in fact, gives you one of the things that we're going to be able to determine later. The ratio of the area, this little area that, the, that we're allowed to walk, walk around on, this little infinitesimal area, to the area on the unit sphere that the, the point of this is normal traces out is exactly the counterpart to what we call curvature in the two-dimensional case. In the case of curvature in 2D, we talk about the arc length, delta S, and we talk about how the, the angle changes, which is simply a size on the unit sphere. And the ratio of this to this, that is to say arc, angular swing or equivalently length of on the unit circle of the swing per unit step is what we call the curvature of a curve in 2D. And here we're going to talk about the ratio of areas, how the, how the normal swings on the unit sphere per, per little area down there. And we're going to give that a name. It's called the Gaussian curvature. A uh, whole lot of this theory was developed by Carl Friedrich Gauss. Uh, and it gets the name K, and that's going to, and it's simply going to be one of these invariants, namely the determinant of M2. And later, we're going to be looking at trace of M2 and finding it as an invariant as well. <laughs> OK, but enough about that uh, sense of where we're going. In order to uh, be able to handle uh, all of this, uh, this general idea of thinking about how normal swing and walking directions and so on, we need a little bit more uh, 
mechanism, a uh, little bit more understanding. So just as we understood that the operator <coughs> dv for any walking direction dv could be written in <coughs> uh, sorry dv of f could, could be written in in uh, partial in terms of partial derivatives of f and the dot product would be we're going to be wanting to think of this operator dv itself <clears throat> as 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 an operator and what does it what does it do well what it does <clears throat> it's a an operator <clears throat> that if you take any entity that f can be a scalar function that f can be a normal can be the f can be a principal direction vector it can, it'll be any of those things okay so this f maybe it could be anything but if we look at the operator this operator what does it do it turns uh, if, if this is a scalar it turns that into a into a scalar Right? It turns F into a scalar. If you apply it to a vector, the normal, it turns the vector into a different vector. Right? Okay, we're going to be interested in this operator that has, has a space to stick in the walking direction. And it's going to be a map from scalars to scalars, or vectors to vectors, or frames to frames, because later we're going to be interested in, remember that we said that the, the very first lecture, that mm -hmm. what we're going to be talking about is a fitted frame. We said the fitted frame could be simply the normal in any pair directions, V and V perp, or it could be the particular frame, uh, the first principal direction in the second principal direction and their respective k's because the t's are both zero in that case <laughs> right and which we call kappa one and kappa two and i call the directions p1 and p2 then we can be asking as we walk along a particular walking direction how does that frame swing it's going to swing the norm is going to swing also the principal directions are going to change and we're going to be interested in how. So there are all sorts of things that we're going to be able to stick in this in this operand place. But for now, let's talk about the operator, D. This operator here, D, uh, with its operand about to be put in. <clears throat> so it's a function. It's an operate operator. And. That operator is linear in the thing you put in there, okay? And it's understood as a, a measuring device. It measures something about f, if f is scalar, the function f, okay? <laughs> Namely, the directional derivative in the v direction. It, me it measures something about uh, the swing of the normal if you put a normal in there it's a it's a me, it's something that's a measuring tool and it's a linear measuring tool and it gets a special name in mathematics and it's really in, in order to read the literature of all of mathematics involving geometry you have to in any calculus you have to understand this guy and it's called a one this suggests that there'll be a two form and a three form, uh, but mostly we're going to be concerned with the one form. And in this summary course, I'll barely wave my hands at the two forms and three forms, and we'll see that they're related to some to things that are called one vectors and two vectors and three vectors. Uh, okay, so ordinary vector is a one vector. Um, okay, so a one form, what is it? 
Well, what it is, is a pile of planes that are equally spaced, okay, with some spacing, and they have a direction in the sense that all the planes have a common normal because they're parallel planes, okay, so they have a common normal. And they're spaced some amount apart. And the way they operate on a, on a vector is to count the number of crossings that the vector makes. OK, so, <clears throat> so if I pick a particular vector, it's going to tell me there are 2.36 crossings. Of that of that plane. So in two D, <coughs> um, this uh, one form that I've just drawn is just a sequence of planes some distance apart, and it's going to be something that I can stick a vector in. And this particular vector that I put in right there, out comes two, right? And if I put in this vector, out comes minus two. <coughs> okay, so we have this me these measuring devices, and they're linear, both in the things they're measuring, the vectors, and in the the operator itself, which has which itself has a direction and a magnitude, and the magnitude is somehow going to be related to the distance between the planes. Uh, I don't kind of understand what, what these planes come from. What are these planes come from? Like, they don't come from anything. They're the, any, more than a, any more than a coordinate system comes from anything. It is a vector. Where does a vector come from? A vector comes from an abstract notion of a thing that has a length and a direction, and it sits there in, in space. Okay, that's a vector. This is the same kind of a thing. It, it is a thing that has a direction and a size, and what it consists of is visualized is this sequence of planes. Because the number of crossing of this uh, unit vector with this plane depending on the spacing of this plane, right? So yes, it, absolutely. It increase the spacing, like it, it, it minus one, it will be minus one, so how I don't kind of understand how we define this spacing and also the length of this vector. You will, you will see that in a moment. Uh, exactly the right question to ask Yadzong, but you're getting ahead of me. For the time being, we have the idea that we have, and we have an operator, okay? And okay, so. We have an operator, and it's going to be an operator on vectors. And that operator itself is going to have a direction. That's this V in here. <clears throat> and it's going to somehow deliver out the directional derivative of, for example, this scalar function that we have. And you're absolutely right that different there'll be different operators that we may want to want to have, and they'll give different measurements. Okay, but for the time being, grant me the, the grant me the idea that there is this basic entity that's a measuring device that takes vectors in and produces scalars out. Okay. <laughs> um. And it works that way. And it turns out <clears throat> that it's, it itself is a completely linear entity. Okay, so let's be careful. The, uh, there is something called the sharp operator. That's a toggle. 
and it turns sharp V into a corresponding one point. It turns V sharp, turns a vector into a corresponding one form. Okay, and the one form it's going to be, that it's going to define, is going to have spacings that are inversely proportional to the size of V and such that the the, 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 ortho, the direction common the common orthogonal to all these planes is equal to V. Okay, so this is going to be an operator that the for any given V, there's its corresponding measuring device, and the planes get closer as the vector gets longer, as V gets longer. And we have this sharp operator. It turns out that you can show, and I'm, I do show by this uh, presence at the display on the screen, that there is a purely gener uh, there is a purely geometric way to define sharp V in terms of V. And it says, so the idea is <clears throat> if you have a vector of length greater than one, and if we don't, if it's less than one, we're going to just uh, take its reciprocal length and then it'll be, it, it'll be greater than one. But if it's greater than one, we, we find that we put the tip of the, uh, the tail of the vector at the center of a unit sphere. We put the tip at the, wherever it goes to, at the other end of V. We look at the tangent plane, <laughs> sorry, the tangent line between the tip of V and the unit sphere. And that's going to form a cone. And that cone is going to, uh, at the at the loci of the tangent places, be a plane, right? You see that on the here on the screen. Whoop! Oh god! I guess it is. Okay. And now we're going to put one plane at the center and one plane here, and that's the that's this sharp V thing. The, the spacing you can prove is exactly as I promised, reciprocal to the length of V, and ortho, all these planes are orthogonal to V. So what I'm saying is this one form thing is just as basic a thing as a vector is. You don't need any coordinates to define it, right? <clears throat> it's just, if you have a vector V, there is this sharp V thing. That's a measuring device, and you can put sharp V And, and say, I'm going to apply that operator to another vector w, and it's going to be a measurement of the component of w in the v direction, but with respect to their, with respect to their lengths. Aha! Uh -huh. We've just said that the dot product is not some x i y i, uh, whatever for two vectors x and y. It's completely geometrically definable. Right, we have a we have a a one form operator that is completely geometric. We have a uh, a vector thing which is completely geometric, and we now have this thing that we're going to call the contraction of uh, of the sharp v operator into uh, um, onto w, and that sure enough. In Euclidean geometry, is okay. In Euclidean geometry, that's equal to what we call v dot w. But now we have a much better geometric understanding of what the heck v, w, v dot w is, and more importantly, or as importantly, we have a tool that's going to be able to allow us to take non-Euclidean geometry, because 
We're going to be interested, for example, in vectors on, on, surf, on surfaces, on curved surfaces. And Euclidean geometry doesn't apply to, to behavior on curved surfaces. And so we're going to want to be able to talk about this operation on curved surfaces, but now the sharp has got to be a different kind of sharp. So, okay, so the, the point is, so far, I've defined a Euclidean operator, sharp V. And <clears throat> later, we're going to define other sharps uh, in, on curved surfaces. Okay? Um, moreover, sharp is a toggle in the sense that sharp V sharp of sharp V can be understood as V, <laughs> okay? So in other words, this thing, if you have one of these sets of planes and you know the spacing, you can take the reciprocal of the spacing and say that's the length of V. You know what the orthogonal vector to it, it unit vector is to it. You take that the, the that length times that vec that vector direction, and you get the v. And so we we're going to use sharp in both both ways. We're going to be talking about sharp of one forms, which are going to be vectors, and sharp of vectors, which are going to be <coughs> uh, one forms. And all of non-Euclidean Riemannian so-called Riemannian geometry depends on redefining what these sharps are. <coughs> Okay, so I promised briefly that I would say what a uh, what a uh, a two a two form is. Well, first of all, we need an idea of a two vector. A two vector is something an, a little aerial component. Just as a one vector is a little is a directed linear component, we want to be able to have a, a directed aerial component, okay? And that's called a two vector. And you can have a directed volume component. Uh, that's a three vector, and so on. Uh, and the uh, measurement devices that you apply to two vectors are called two forms, and they can they consist of this kind of a Directed sub uh, uh, subdivision of space into into column into little uh, parallelogram columns, if you will, and you can take one of these little bi, bi vectors and count how many intersections it takes aerially with these columns, and you get the measurement of a of a two form measuring a two vector. And you will not be too surprised that we'll, if we cut it up that way. Again, and have now little boxes, we can measure volumes of things with <coughs> of three vectors with with three forms. But that's all I'm going to say about about the two vectors, the two forms and the two vectors and the three forms and the three vectors. Why? Do we, okay, so why do we develop this mechanism? Well, we develop this mechanism because it allows us a to talk about geometric things that we're going to care about, which is um, how things move on curved surfaces, okay? Not and what we mean by things like length on curved surfaces and 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 so on, uh, and we need a general mechanism to describe that, and also <clears throat> because ultimately. I remind you from last lecture that the major thing we said we were going to be concerned with was the behavior of a fitted frame as you walk along, along on a surface or the behavior of a fitted frame as you walk along a curve. Okay, And in order to do that, we're going to need to talk about walking directions and and vectors all in the same framework. And we're going to be talking about, we did already talk about this idea, D of N. 
<coughs> this directional derivative dv of n. Um, we, we will find it very much less confusing if instead of talking about the, the vectors, we talk about the, 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 shock, the one forms that correspond to it. It'll be easier to think about what happens to, to the derivative of a one form than to think about what talk about the derivative of a vector. Okay? And so that convenience is another reason for, for defining these measuring devices that we call one forms. Okay? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> coming to the Towards the end of the hour, we get 10 more minutes. <clears throat> there are two basic notions that I'm going to uh, put in your head here, and we'll come back to both of them. The first is this notion that sharp can be a different thing, depending. And one way to understand this is if we put v in coordinates, v1, v2, v3. <coughs> nah, that's not right. This is a vector. This is a tuple. Sorry, that isn't a vector. You guys may have learned it's a vector. It ain't a vector. It's a it's a tuple. It's a tuple representing a vector. The vector it represents is v1, uh, e1, v1, d by dx, plus v2, d by dy, plus v3, d by dz. All right. So that's, this thing's a vector. Scalar times this vector plus a scalar times that vector. Okay, and we use in the computer v1, v2, v3, that tuple to represent that vector, but it isn't the vector. That's the vector. This is the representation. <laughs> what we know in the normal sharp is if we call this thing this tuple v under one. So I'm being careful. When I put an arrow over something, it's a geometric thing. When I put an underline on it, it's a, it's a tuple. It's an array, right? <laughs> this guy represents this vector, but the vector is a geometric thing. This thing it depends on coordinates. And what we've seen is that uh, V transpose I, where I is the unit, make the the diagonal matrix of ones, the identity matrix, <laughs> times W is going to be uh, the thing that we use to measure both lengths and directions. How lengths? Well, we take V V T I V and we get the length, the square of the length of V. Okay, so we're going to say the length of V. Is sharp V <coughs> contracted on V the half? Everything here is completely geometric. No coordinates need apply. <coughs> and we have this idea that <coughs> this thing divided sh sharp V on W, sharp V, contracted on W, divided by the size of V and the size of W is the cosine of the angle between them. And so it's a definition of angle. But now we've defined this length purely in terms of geometry and that length 
purely in terms of geometry, and that thing is purely in terms of geometry, and so we have angle defined purely in terms of geometry without any reference to any coordinate system. Okay? But when you do it in coordinates, what you end up with is a matrix here in the middle that is positive definite. <clears throat> uh, it's called a metric tensor. And we're going to find that as being pretty important. And the metric tensor sort of says, how do we make measurements? And how do we measure angles? Those are the two things it does. In fact, what it's really doing is telling us up what sharp is. Okay, It's telling us the new sharp. The Euclidean sharp has the identity matrix stuck in there. And this kind of sharp. OK, so. Uh, has a has a different positive definite matrix in there. <laughs> so, um, that, okay. So that was the one one thing I wanted to tell you is that we're going to we 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 will want to generalize sharp, and we will generalize it by essentially figuring out what other what different metric tensors we need here that define what we mean by sharp or v or sharp and w. <clears throat> and we'll capture how you measure lengths and how you measure angles. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> okay, so that was the one thing I said I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say is we're going to want to talk about frames and the rate of change of frames as we walk along the surface. And I've suggested that change of vectors is hard to think about. So let's look at the, the sharp of a frame. <laughs> okay, so we have a frame, F, which is a tuple of three vectors, V1, V2, and V3, that are all unit vectors and <clears throat> all orthogonal to each other in the appropriate right-handed right coordinate system, so that V1 cross V2 equals V3, and V3 cross V1 equals V2, and so on. And by the way, uh, pretty soon we'll see that cross product we don't need any algebra for. That can be done purely ge geometrically, too. But fine, we have this idea. But we're going to create this new thing that I'm going to call sigma that is simply sharp V1, sharp V2, and sharp V3. So it's a tuple of one frames. Right? Yeah. The one along the V1 direction. And they unit one frames because I remind you that the spacing, OK, uh, yeah, I needed one other thing. The, one other, the other thing I need is. <laughs> In Euclidean geometry, the size of V and the size of sharp V are going to be related by the same thing. It turns out it has to do with using G inverse instead of G. But if I, G, G is I, that, that you, you get I inverse itself. But fine, the point is that, you get, you, that when you have, in Euclidean geometry, when you have a unit vector, you have unit spacing. In that of the planes in that direction. Okay, so we want a name for these unit vectors in special directions. You will see that these names do very nicely. Thank you. Dx now takes on a whole new meaning for you. It's a one form. It's a measuring the it's a measurement device that is unit spaced along the x direction. And dy is unit spaced along <coughs> the y direction. Put another way, this guy is sharp d by dx. This guy is sharp d by dy. And this guy is sharp d by dz. OK? And they are respectively the 
planes spaced along the x direction, unit spacing that you can put any vector on. When you contract on a vector, what do you get? You get the coordinate in that in that vector, <laughs> right? Uh, likewise for the ones in y and the ones in z. <laughs> and moreover, all this one form business is uh, linear in two ways. It's linear in the things that these measuring devices are applied to, namely vectors. But it's also linear in the sense that we can talk about alpha dx plus beta dy plus gamma dz and talk about the, the uh, <coughs> directional derivative, alpha, beta, gamma, uh, <coughs> with respect, and it all works. I'm not going to prove it. The point is that we now have all the same things for these one forms that we're used to for vectors, that we can, we can add them, we can multiply scalars by them, and so on. OK, so we're at the end of this, this lecture. <laughs> and where we're going to go next lecture is we're going to take these ideas <coughs> and look at this d sigma, or more precisely, this the V of sigma thing. We're going to say, how does the frame swing as we walk in, in any particular walking direction? See you next time. Thank you.